No, this this side always. This way? Yeah. Enter and exit this side, yep. Great. And you were happy with it? It's all on screen, all good? Yeah, no, that's Great. good. No, that's good. Nice work. That's good. Um, that's good. On your chin. Yeah. Yep. Perfect. Okay. Um, it doesn't buzz when it's actually touching you? Nothing. No, no okay. Um, perfect. Without the mask. Good afternoon, folk. Good morning, folk, I should say. That's okay. If you could, rather than have an, an angle out like that, sure. down like that. So this could be touching your breastbone. Sure. That's, that's kind of how it goes. Perfect. Morning, morning folk. Yeah. Morning, folk. Okay. It might feel weird, but it doesn't look, it doesn't look odd at all. Okay.
shelter me in this storm. Turn to me, see my distress and need. Weary and poor, I come calling upon your name. You are forgiven. Well, good morning and welcome to Sunday Live. My name's Kate. I'm one of the members here at St Phil's. Welcome. And if you're joining us for the first time, great to have you. Otherwise, I believe this is our 14th Sunday online. But hopefully we're on the home stretch, rapidly approaching the time when we can meet together again and what a sweet day that will be. Last week, we began a new series, Building on the Rock, exploring Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and we continue that today. But before we go any further, let's just take a moment to pause and prepare ourselves to hear God. Uh, Because when we're watching online, it's so easy to be distracted by the pile of washing that still hasn't been put away, or our social media feed, or the antics of the kids. So let's pray. Father God, please uncrowd our minds, please quieten our hearts, please soothe our souls, and help us to hear clearly what you have to say to us this morning. Amen. We're watching a series of videos put together by the late J.I. Packer, uh, a theologian, a man who had a brilliant mind and also an ability to clearly communicate profound truths. And today he shares with us on faith. I believe that faith is the most important thing in the world by which I mean that faith is the link between ourselves and a God of transforming love who saves us from sin and folly and ultimate disaster, who brings us into a life of joy and peace and wisdom 
and fruitfulness. Faith means, quite simply, trusting him by believing what he's told us. And remember, the real God, the God of the scriptures, is a God who has revealed himself, he has spoken, he has given us promises to trust. Faith trusts them, and the effect of trusting the promises and trusting the God of the promises is literally transforming. Whoever you are, you need this. And so I simply say, don't allow yourself to fancy that you've got faith when all that you really have is a sort of general optimism or hopefulness about the future. You only have faith when you have learned to trust God trust his word and treat him as a partner in your life whom you're trusting in the way that you would treat or spouse a good friend, any human who has given you promises and on whom you rely to keep those promises once given. It makes the Christian life exciting. Yes, it is. So I ask you, have you ever reckoned seriously with the reality of faith and the possibility of a thrilling new life that results from exercising faith in the Father and his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, faith is the link between ourselves and a God of transforming love, who saves us from sin and folly and ultimate disaster who brings us into a life of joy and peace and wisdom and fruitfulness. So let's confess our sin and our folly to God, trusting his promises to wash our sins away and transform us. Let's pray. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We're going to have our Bible read now. Grab your Bibles, reading from Matthew 5, 13 to 20. And Steve's going to bring us that. Thanks. Morning, St. Phillips. Uh, this passage is the continuation of Jesus' discourse to his disciples, which we know as a Sermon on the Mount. Jesus begins by talking about salt, a substance of great importance in the ancient world. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father, in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, or if you know your old authorised version, not a jot or a tittle, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning.
morning. Great to be together this morning. Uh, A few years ago, the American author and philosopher A.J. Jacobs decided to spend a year trying to live by every 700 or so rules and commands that he could find in the Bible. And he wrote about his experience in his book, The Year of Living Biblically. Uh, It's a good read, a bit like reality TV for readers. And in places, it's actually quite funny. For instance, he relentlessly told the truth for a whole year, which, as you can imagine, often got him into trouble. Well, how do you reckon he went? Well, on some things, he did pretty well. He delighted, for instance, in taking seriously the command to be fruitful and multiply, which resulted in he and his wife conceiving twins in that year. But he did also find it immensely difficult. And he often failed, um, leaving himself curiously guilty, he reflects. Well, of course, it was uh, a light-hearted experiment, uh, but it did reveal something interesting, uh, a number of interesting things, actually. It showed the absurdity of trying to live in the modern world based on an ancient legal code, particularly the ceremonial code of Leviticus. I mean, if you get uh, an infectious skin disease, are you really going to take yourself off to a priest for him to look at it, or are you going to take yourself to a doctor? And I think that was the point for A.J. Jacob. So many of the Old Testament laws made little sense to him. They seemed kind of random and arbitrary, irrelevant to modern life. He simply couldn't grasp their point, which, of course, makes it very difficult to live by them. Well, what about us? The Old Testament, along with its commands, can seem strange to us. Its world, its culture, its spirituality seem so different from our own experience. And in fact, to some people, it's so strange that it often gets overlooked or ignored. So as Bible-believing Christians, as followers of Jesus, what place does the Old Testament law, indeed all of the Bible's commands, have in our lives? Well, Jesus confronted similar questions in his own day. His application of the Old Testament law wasn't exactly orthodox or conventional, and it often got him into trouble. In the passage that Steve read for us today, Jesus helps us think about the place of the Old Testament law, summed up in that phrase, the law and the prophets. And indeed, he thinks us help, about, uh, help us think about all the commands in the Bible and what it means to live by them. So our passage, uh, hopefully you've got it there in front of you, uh, begins uh, there in verse 17 with Jesus responding to criticism about his attitude to the law. Uh, to the law and the prophets, that is the teaching of the Old Testament. According to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, Israel's religious leaders, um, they kind of thought he uh, appeared to disregard the law. Uh, They often accused him of ignoring or flouting the law, effectively abolishing the law. But you'll notice that Jesus rejects that accusation. Far from abolishing the law, Jesus says in Matthew 5.17 that he came to fulfil the law. And so the question for us is, what does he mean by that? In what sense does Jesus fulfil the law and prophets? Well, two ways at least. Firstly, in a predictive sense, Jesus fulfils the predictions and the promises made in the Old Testament about the coming of the kingdom of God. So there are specific promises, for instance, in the Old Testament about the, the coming of the Messiah, God's king, who would establish God's righteousness in his world. Well, Jesus is that Messiah. He fulfills those promises. But what of the law's commands? In what sense does Jesus fulfil those? Well, in the sense that he reveals their true intention. Jesus takes us to their underlying principle and purpose so that their intent can actually be fulfilled. That's the second way, I think, in which Jesus fulfils the law. You see, there was a problem with the way that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law understood the law. And sometimes we make this mistake as well. They thought that keeping the law was about obeying the letter of the law. They had little sense of the law's intention or its purpose or its goal. So, for instance, according to Old Testament law, you couldn't work on the Sabbath. And by Jesus' time, the Pharisees had developed an elaborate list of activities that defined what was and what wasn't work. So when in Matthew 12, just a little bit later in this gospel, Jesus heals a man on the Sabbath, the Pharisees considered that a form of work. And so they accuse him of breaking God's law by failing to observe the Sabbath. And Jesus' response is enlightening because it reveals 
a really important principle for understanding all of the commands of God. Jesus justifies his actions on the basis that in healing the man, he was doing good, that he was acting in the man's interest. In Mark's telling of the same event, Jesus famously says, the Sabbath was made for people, not people for the Sabbath. According to Jesus, the Old Testament command to keep the Sabbath had a purpose beyond itself and that purpose was for our benefit. It's a good purpose. God in his goodness commanded his people to rest because he knew it was good for us. It is not an arbitrary demand to test how good we are at keeping his word. What Jesus wants us to do is understand that God's commands have a good purpose an intention, a goal. They are not an end in themselves. And the Pharisees and the teachers of the law just didn't understand that. They were so focused on keeping the letter of the law that they ended up missing the point of the law. The Old Testament law, the the commands of God, wherever we find them in the Bible, are not arbitrary requirements that God expects us to meet in order to belong or to stay in his kingdom. Now, the commands of God express what is important to God. They are a window into the heart and the character of God. They express what God loves and what God hates. So when God says, for instance, don't commit adultery or don't be greedy or love your neighbour as yourself, it's an expression of the priority that God attaches to relationships, to love as the foundation for human relationships. If you go about breaking those commandments, you actually wreck human relationships. Follow them and human relationships will flourish. And that's what God wants. God's commands are not an ultimate good in themselves. They are a means to a greater good beyond themselves. It's that understanding of the law and what it means to fulfil the law that explains Jesus' words in verses 19 and 20. Jesus says, Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is clearly critiquing the Pharisees and the teachers of the law for their faulty understanding of what it means to live by the law. In focusing on the letter of the law while ignoring the intent of the law, they effectively set aside the law. Jesus will actually intensify that criticism later on in chapter 23 when he actually says to them in that well-known passage, Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy and faithfulness. You should have practised the latter without neglecting the former. According to Jesus, The Pharisees and teachers of the law were more interested in the minutiae of the letter of the law and ignored the weightier, more important matter of their purpose and their goal. Well, Jesus wants his followers to grasp and understand the goal and the intent of the law and to fulfil that. That's what it means for Jesus to fulfil the law. And that explains then his words in verse 20, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, on first listening, that is a stunning claim. Most people in Jesus' day thought that uh, when it came to righteousness, there was no one who could surpass the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Of course, thinking of righteousness at this point in terms of obedience to the law, but Whereas the Pharisees and teachers of the law were concerned with a strict external obedience to the letter of the law, what Jesus is calling for is a a deeper, more far-reaching kind of observance. One that comes from here, from the heart. One that discerns the good intent and goal of God's commands and where a person sets their heart on that. For Jesus, observing the law involved more than making sure the letter of the law was not infringed. For him, it was important that the deeper implications of what God had commanded be understood and put into practice. Know that, follow that principle, and you'll be fulfilling the law in a way that the Pharisees and teachers of the law never could. And so, in the part of the reading Steve didn't read for us, 
uh, it's a long reading and we just decided to, um, to, to cut it short. You'll notice if you have your Bibles there, in verses 21 and following, so verses 21 to 48 in particular, Jesus actually illustrates and applies this principle, this way of observing the law in a number of brief case studies. He refers to things like murder and adultery, divorce, uh, oaths and so on. Now you can see it there in your Bibles. And each one of those examples, each one of those case studies actually follows the same pattern. Jesus begins by saying how a certain Old Testament command had come to be understood in his own day. You've heard that it was said, he says, to introduce each one. And then each time he shows the intent or the goal of the particular law in question. And two features stand out in particular as Jesus applies this understanding and application of the law. Firstly, What he does is focus on the inner motive and attitude above the outward visible observance of the law. And the other feature is this. He focuses on the goal or the purpose of the law, the underlying principle which should actually govern our conduct. So uh, in the first two examples, in verses 21 to 30, Jesus affirms that the acts of murder and adultery are wrong. Yes, but he goes deeper. And he highlights the underlying thoughts and attitudes which underlie those acts. So he says that an act of murder actually springs from a hateful heart. He says that an act of adultery springs from a lustful heart. Now, don't misunderstand what Jesus is saying here. He's not saying that a lustful thought is the moral equivalent of committing adultery or that an angry word is the moral equivalent of murder. No, of course not. That's not the point. What Jesus is illustrating is that in both cases, it's the underlying state of the heart, one's inner motivation that gives rise to certain conduct. And that's where our attention ought to be. And not only with outward actions. Jesus is critiquing a certain understanding of the law, whereby as long as you don't transgress a strictly defined definition of the law, you can somehow maintain moral purity. So what do we do with this? How do we apply this to our own lives? What are we to think of the Old Testament, its commands, indeed all of the commands that we read in the Bible? Well, I think we need to remember that uh, Jesus' own quite radical interpretation uh, of the law. Uh, He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment and the second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Well-known words of Jesus. Love for God and neighbour. Capture Jesus' whole approach to observing the law. It's the point on which he actually ends this block of teaching in Matthew chapter 5 on the principle of love for enemies. Verse 43 and following. Love for God and neighbour, which includes our enemies, is the guiding principle for us as we seek to understand how it is God wants us to observe his commands and live in the world as citizens of his kingdom. In providing such a a broad interpretation of the law, Jesus effectively deepens our response to the law and to his commands. He not only reveals the purpose and the goal of God's commands, he also reveals what must be in our hearts as we seek to fulfil them. This overriding law of love, uh, love for God, love for neighbour, provides the purpose and the goal of all of the Bible's laws and commands and it governs the way that we're to seek to observe and to fulfil them. Not, of course, that that gives us licence to ignore the commands that uh, we find in the Bible. They're still important because they actually give shape and definition to what it means to love either God or or our neighbour. Nor when we come to the commands of the Bible, should we ask, what's the minimum I'm required to do to fulfil the command? Or how far can I go before I break the command? No, no, rather, we can ask, how might I fulfil its purpose and goal as I seek to love God and neighbour more deeply? Do that and you will exceed the righteousness of, of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Let me pray. Our gracious God, we thank you for the record of this great sermon, a sermon that 
uh, has had profound implications in our world in terms of establishing uh, ways of uh, living, patterns of thought. Our gracious God, I do pray for all of us now that you would uh, teach us what it means to live your way in your world, what it means to observe your commands, to live in obedience to them. Will you write your law on our hearts, as the scripture says? Will you change and transform our hearts, incline them to want to live in the way of love for you and our neighbour? Amen. Well, as you know, we as a church support a number of overseas mission partners and from time to time we do love to hear from them. Today, we're going to hear from the Klentsos family in South Africa. They've put together a short video for us. Uh, sit back and enjoy. Hello, St. Phil's. Darian, Benji and Vanessa here from South Africa. Like you, we are in lockdown due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The response to the virus has had to look different in South Africa and further into the African continent. Currently, South Africa is in its third wave and the government reports over 20,000 new cases a day. Travel restrictions have made ministry in Africa significantly more complicated. However, thankfully, the Lord has graciously kept the door open for it to continue. Two of the South Sudanese students sponsored by CORE, Alex and Casmiro, graduated with their degree in theology from George Whitfield College in Cape Town at the end of last year. They have now joined John and Elias as lecturers on the faculty at Bishop Wing College in Juba in South Sudan. Together, they train pastors and Christian workers for ministry throughout the nation of South Sudan in subjects like Romans, New Testament, ethics, public speaking, African religions, preaching and books of the Old Testament. John was even consecrated as an Anglican bishop after his first year of teaching at the college. Well-trained Christian leaders are in very high demand in war-torn South Sudan as the church reaches all corners of the nation and very influential leaders, but many pastors with congregations have never been theologically trained. Six more South Sudanese pastors are undertaking further studies in Cape Town. It hasn't been easy for them at all, but they are persevering and it is a privilege to support them. Philip and Semi are due to graduate at the end of next year and return to South Sudan to train others. Jock, Garang, Isaac and Marco are also in the process of completing their studies and our hope is that they will all be used powerfully to strengthen the church in South Sudan. We have also been working with a local Christian organisation in West Africa which supports new Christians who are being persecuted by their families and communities. They work amongst the many local unreached people groups in the area. Access to theological training and resources is scarce in the nations of Africa we work in. Importing books is extremely expensive and also a very lengthy process. So earlier this year, I traveled to West Africa during the Easter period with two laptops that prior to leaving were filled with the Logos Bible Software Academic Research Library. This includes over 3,000 biblical resources such as commentaries, books on doctrine, journal articles and video lectures from some of the most respected authors and biblical scholars today. Since returning, our local partner has expressed to us what a huge impact this has made in his ministry, including his sermon preparation, discipleship training and public debates, which he has recently been able to have with Muslim sheikhs over the reliability of the Christian Bible. The Logos Bible Academic Research Library is a tool that core training intends to integrate into our ministry in the future as we seek to serve and strengthen the church in Africa. Homeschooling has been a steep learning curve for all of us, but Benji's doing really well and enjoying most of his various activities and lessons. He really loves Minecraft, reading, swimming and ice cream. 
We're part of a number of homeschooling groups and have met diverse and interesting people. There are many gospel opportunities with these other homeschooling parents and kids, so please keep praying the Lord will open doors for the gospel and give us boldness to share of his lordship and love. Thank you for the various ways you partner with us, St Phil's. We pray that no matter where we are, that he will bless all of us with great fruitfulness and encouragement as we serve him. Good morning, St. Phillips. Join with me as we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can worship you today. Bless each of our homes as we set aside this time to hear your word and to seek your face. Continue to lead us by the power of your Holy Spirit as we seek to be salt and light in our community. Father, today we bring before you Darian, Vanessa, and Benji in South Africa. Thank you for their faithfulness in serving you through the work of core training and development as they provide Bible training to strengthen the African church. Thank you, Father, that Darian was able, recently able to visit South Sudan to encourage new grads Alex and Casmiro, along with Elias and Bishop John, who are now teaching Bible students at Bishop Gwyn College. We pray for protection, health and safety for all students and staff at the college. Increase their faith and love of you as they grow in knowledge and understanding of your word. As Darian prepares to travel to Australia to renew his visa and visit family, give him travelling mercies and a time of refreshing. We pray for blessing and protection over Vanessa and Benji as they remain behind. Be with Vanessa as she homeschools Benji that this might be a fruitful time of learning for him. Thank you for the opportunity they have to mix with other children and families. Give them wisdom to know how to bless and help those around them. Let them be salt and light. Father, we pray for our small groups and leaders. Through the wonders of technology, many of us have been able to remain in fellowship with one another. Thank you. As COVID restrictions possibly lift in the near future, show us as a church how best to manage both these times of fellowship and also our times of corporate worship. Give Jamie, Brian, Tom and Glenn and Alicia great wisdom in all the decisions that need to be made. Father, your word in 1 Timothy 2 says, exhorts us to pray for those in authority over us so that we may live quiet and peaceful lives as we worship and honour you. Today we pray for Cedric Spencer, the new Mayor of Kuringai. Bless him in his new role and his fellow councillors as they make decisions for the residents of Kuringai. Likewise, bless our Premier and Prime Minister as they lead the state and the nation at this difficult time. We pray all these things In the name of Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. A few notices. Um, Don't forget to join us online for our lockdown prayer meetings every Tuesday at 1. And just a heads up that we'll be sharing the Lord's Supper next Sunday. So prepare some juice and bread to have with you. Wanted to give a thank you to our tech team this morning who are just so critical in bringing us Sunday Live each week. Today it's Drew and Ian. So thanks to them. I'm going to have our final song. And I think this song, when I heard it, really resonated with me and might resonate with some of you two here in week 14 of lockdown. Do you feel weary, worn and sad? Come to Jesus and find rest.
as we turn off our devices now and get up and think about how to live. Let's remember God's overriding law of love and seek to love God and neighbour deeply. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.